Summer Olympics have finally ended and uh, we can all now go back to our normal lives, uh, caring about real sports like baseball and, and football and hockey and uh, good sports like that. Uh, not things like ping pong and the uneven parallel bars or I think they even had break dancing in uh, this uh, Summer Olympics. And I get it, you, you know, you wanna, you wanna support your country, but, but I mean, come on, ping pong. Ping pong, is that, is that really a sport? <laughs> but, but we can't help ourselves, right? Every time the Olympics come around, uh, we tend to be a people who like to just kind of jump on the bandwagon of, of the popular things and act like we care about uh, a lot of those sports that uh, we generally don't think about except every once every four years. And it isn't just with the Olympics. Uh, this idea of jumping on the bandwagon all the time uh, can happen around many different things. Uh, we jump on the bandwagon when there is excitement created around um, things like fashion. I remember when I was a teenager, every, every teenage boy had to have Nike Air tennis shoes, right? Uh, that was like something that everybody had to have. Um, or it could be centered around even social media trends. Like 10 years ago, I remember, the, remember everybody had to do the ice bucket challenge, which I don't know what it was all about. I don't know what the challenge was, but it seemed like everywhere you look, somebody was dumping ice water on their heads, right? Or it could be a, a popular toy for the Christmas shopping season. And, and if you're old enough, you remember back to the 80s. And of course, you remember the, the Cabbage Patch doll. My sister had to have a Cabbage Patch doll. It was just the coolest thing to have, right? Or possibly, and maybe by far the most annoying jumping on the bandwagon that is out there, is when it concerns your favorite sports teams right? Uh, and this is my little pet peeve, so I'm just going, going off the script a little bit here. I just want to tell you, um, a true sports fan that has suffered through years of failure and many people around them saying things like, I don't know why you care. They're terrible. Those guys make too much money. I got better things to do with my time than support that team. And then the second they start winning, who are the first people who are wearing all of their gear? There's not an ounce of skin that isn't covered with the, the team logo. You see how that can be a, a, a little annoying. They're best friends with all the players, right? They seem to have, you know, they see the players in Target or something and they, they uh, act like they're best friends with them and they uh, all of a sudden become experts about things that they know nothing about because they don't watch the sport. And they're acting like they're your team's most loyal followers. You know, they're jumping on the bandwagon. And that can be annoying, am I right? Well, this phrase, jumping on the bandwagon, it, it goes way back. It's, it's something that's been around for a couple hundred years in our country. It has its origins in the 1800s, and, and it was linked to, to circuses and uh, also political campaigning. That's a bandwagon right there. In the mid-19th century, when circuses would travel from town to town, of course, there was no... Uh, you know, advertising like you would have today. There's not television, there's not radio, internet, things like that. So they would just come into town with this brightly uh, decorated wagon and it had a band on it and it was playing music and just to attract attention, telling everybody in the town that the circus was on its way and this wagon was known, of course, as the bandwagon. And people would jump all over it in excitement and they would ride it as, as it worked its way through town because it was like the biggest thing that was going to happen to the town was the circus was coming. And so this bandwagon idea started getting picked up by uh, political campaigners too. It, particularly uh, 1848 presidential campaign of Zachary Taylor. Uh, I hope no one here remembers that campaign. But in, in no time... Uh, politicians were using these bandwagons too, and, and it was attention grabbing, and, uh, excitement, and generated popularity around uh, their campaign. And so over time, uh, the phrase became known as uh, joining with or aligning with a popular trend or movement, uh, often to gain 
uh, maybe some advantage or, or at least to avoid missing out on something that uh, seems to have widespread approval. And this bandwagon jumping actually has a psychological uh, phenomenon around it known as the bandwagon effect. And the effect refers to people adopting certain behaviors or, or styles or attitudes simply because others are doing so. Essentially, the popularity of a trend increases its attractiveness, leading more people to jump on the bandwagon. People are like this, of course, for a couple of reasons. Uh, generally, we are people that are influenced by actions and opinions of others, whether we believe it or not, or we say that we aren't influenced by others. We, in many ways, are. Often, we want to fit in to be accepted by a group, and also, we might want to adopt a trend because if other people are doing it, it sort of legitimizes it, right? If everybody's doing it, then that must mean that it's, it's right. And true, although we all know um, that just because a lot of people are believing it or doing it, it doesn't mean that it's right. What's the old phrase your parents told you? If your friend was jumping off a bridge, you know, would you also? Now, it's one thing when you have a bandwagon jumper when you're being annoyed at a Super Bowl party, uh, which, by the way, a little side note there, if you're having a Super Bowl party, when your team is in the Super Bowl, it means you're a bandwagon jumper, okay? Because true fans can't concentrate on a party. They can't concentrate on entertaining people when, they're, when their team is going for a championship, right? So a true fan doesn't have a Super Bowl party. Uh, but anyway, that's just a little sidebar. It's one thing when you're being annoyed at a Super Bowl party by a bandwagon jumper. It's a whole other thing when that bandwagon jumping is a mass of people and when it concerns the welfare of a nation, maybe, or a politic, or even when that jumper is one who is a leader of the people, or even a king. If you remember a few weeks back when we were in the To the Summit series, uh, I took a break for a couple of weeks, uh, we were going through the book of Judges, and the book of Judges ends with the words, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And this basically was saying that in Israel they had no leader and they were uh, falling into this moral decay and, and a lot of pagan worship, if you remember us talking about it. There's a, a brief book right after this, uh, The Story of Ruth, which we spoke of a couple weeks ago. And then now we are entering into a different period in Israel's royal kingdom. Now the holy nation of Israel becomes a holy kingdom. And if to help you follow along where I'm going with this sermon series, there is a big insert here that is, helps you follow along. It's a timeline, and you can see... Uh, in your bulletin, you can take this with you and put it in your Bible. And as you read the Bible, this can kind of help you work through the Bible. It's a, it's a work in progress, but as you see uh, in Genesis, it starts with a holy couple, holy family, holy tribe, and holy nation. And you flip it over, we are now into the holy kingdom period of the scriptures. And this period includes Old Testament books of First and Second Samuel, Parts of First Kings, uh, First and Second Chronicles, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Songs. Uh, and this period centers around uh, many king people, including Samuel, Saul, David, King David, and King Solomon, King Saul as well. Israel's kingdom period opens up with the book of Samuel and the story of a man by the name of Samuel. Easy enough. Samuel was one of the last judges of Israel, and he was also a prophet of Yahweh. He was born in a divine way, as many uh, prophets, as many leaders of uh, the Old Testament and New Testament are born. He was born to a barren mother, Hannah. And from his birth, he was dedicated to the service of the Lord. And if you remember, a judge uh, 
had not only held a political responsibility, but also a religious one. And this religious responsibility that Samuel had was uh, where he thrived. He was uh, mostly influenced, influencing in that way. After some time of being a judge himself, Samuel's getting old. He appoints his two sons as judges. They don't work out because they are corrupt. Uh, he didn't teach his children well. Uh, but because of this, Israel just gets fed up with all of these judges that are ruling the separate tribes. And they ask Samuel to appoint a king for them so that they can, quote, be like all the other nations. You see, they want a king for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, they thought a king would centralize authority. It would unite the 12 tribes under one leader, bring stability from all the turmoil and bad leadership of the multiple judges, protect them from all the outside enemies because their armies would be stronger because they would be united as tribes, right? And two, Maybe it was just a little bandwagon jumping. Uh, we want to be like the other nations, they say. They got kings. Seems to be working out for them. It seems like the thing to do for nations. We should too. Well, the request may appear to make sense in some ways. Uh, the request exposed, though, one fundamental problem that Israel has failed to see. Israel is blind to the facts still, even after all of the, the, what they've been through, through the Exodus experience and through the gaining of the nation, they are blind to the fact that God is their king. Yahweh is their king. In asking for a human king, Israel is essentially rejecting God's kingship over them. He even says that wanting instead to be like all the other nations, wanting instead to jump on the bandwagon on how to have their nation ruled like the other nations are being ruled. But if you remember, all the other nations around them are what? They're pagan. They're pagan nations. Not exactly the, the bandwagon that you want to be jumping on. Samuel, who is a prophet of God, he hears from God, he speaks to God, and he hears from the Lord that this request is a bad thing. God tells Samuel to tell the people all of the problems that will arise if they have a king. If you don't remember, I'll just read a couple of them for you again. He says that these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders, thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow the ground and to reap the harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give it to his officers and courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one tenth of your flock and you shall be his slaves. God's words, God says to the people. Basically saying a king is gonna impose burdens on the people and eventually gain all the power and enslave them just like Pharaoh did. Oppression will happen. And this is what happens when the people of Israel move away from God and the leadership or his leadership and him as their king over and over again in the Bible. This is what happens when they try to find human solutions to their problems. And this is true not only for the nation of Israel, this is true for today as well. When a people or a society move away from God as their center, as their leadership, as their king, and try to find human solutions to problems, they find a lot of destruction 
and a lot of oppression. And if you just think about it for a second, there have been uh, uh, two big political movements of the last couple of hundred years that have tried to do government without God as their foundation. They are fascism and socialism, or you could say communism. Although different in delivery, uh, without being subject to God's power, they are really essentially two ends of the same coin. Fascism just ends up with power going to a dictator who ends up dictating truth and morality to the people. And communism means that all the power goes to the people, but you eventually realize that the people need led by somebody. And so then all the power shifts from the people to the state. And then the state dictates the truth and morality. And since they are without God, and they are earthly and fallen and sinful, their truth and morality becomes centered around earthly, fallen, sinful things, like how they can retain power, which becomes oppressive. And their morality becomes centered around retaining power, thus becoming murderous. If it's morally okay then to rid society of those they deem as enemies or a threat to their power. Whenever this move away from God has happened in a society or people, just as God warns Israel clear back thousands of years ago, bad things happen. In that day, it was Pharaoh's Egypt and all those pagan nations and all those kings that were surrounding Israel, they all had the same sort of oppression. I could go on and on and on with the names of them. In Jesus' day, it was Caesar's Rome, more contemporary. You have Maoist China, Stalin's Russia, Jacobin's France, Hitler's Germany, Mussolini's Italy. That list goes on and on as well. No God, no power, no freedom, and oppression for the vast majority of people. The Bible truly is the only place to find all the answers and is truly the only place that you can read and interpret the world around you. God's truth and wisdom is the only truth that truly sets us free, that truly allows us to be free. However, despite the warning from God, the Israelites don't listen and instead they double down on their request by saying, no, we are determined to have a king over us so that we may, quote, be like all the other nations. We want to jump on the bandwagon of the other nations. And our king will allow him to govern over us and go out before us and fight our battles for us. And God is kind of like, don't say I didn't warn you. And then he says to Samuel, who is God's prophet, listen to them, give them a king. 1 Samuel 8, 22. And you might ask yourself at this point, why would God allow this? And when I read this scripture, I think of all those nations that have moved away from God and his truth and, and his morality, and they have sat in the consequences of their choices for quite some time. And I think that's why God allows us to have that freedom sometime, because sometimes we need to sit in the consequences of our choices. I've been to Russia many times. People own nothing. They have very limited choices of things they can own. They don't thrive in their careers. They pretty much all make the same wages. There's no taking your money and putting it in a 401k or in the stock market to grow your money. There's none of that that goes on. They're not allowed to own homes or property. They're all sort of uh, living in tenement type housing, not because of choice, but because that's what they were given. They were totally given that. They didn't even choose which one they got. It was just assigned to them. As a nation, as a people, they left God long ago and they have suffered the consequences. And those consequences have been just like God warned, the king has gained all the power and enslaved the people. But here is the good news of the Bible. 
as you continue on in these scriptures. In the story of the people of Israel in the Bible, and also for all of his people today, the good news is that no choice that we can ever make is going to be a threat to God's will and plan for his people. God will use all of Israel's bad choices for his victories, same as how he uses our failings in life for his glory. God will eventually, and that's the key word eventually in these scriptures, he will transform Israel's misguided desires to have an earthly king into a desire for an unending heavenly kingdom and reign, a desire for an all-powerful savior, a Messiah king who will free them from captivity like a new Moses, a king of kings, they will call him brought from the heavens, divinely conceived like a new freedom. The captives will be free, free from all of their sin, free from their sin of turning away from him and jumping on the bandwagon of popular opinion and thinking that they could do it a better way. God will not let the holy people go. And he won't let any of us go. And he won't let anybody who calls him their king go. Eventually. But for now in our story, the story of Israel, God is letting the people jump on the bandwagon. And Samuel has to find a king. And he has to do all that he can to keep this king that's on the way the king that he finds to serve the Lord first. And that's going to be a tough task. We'll get into that next week. Glory be to the Lord our God, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen.